chips and all sorts of things. Hello. 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 Thanks for turning out. See some familiar faces. Don't ask me to remember your name. Um, so why am I here? Who knows really? But I hear that you're not very competitive and you like to come second. <laughs> <laughs> Is this true? I'll just we get some. Uh, in the UK we call it the Mexican way. Who's familiar with that term? I think you call it the wave of the Red Sox, what the crowd does. This is where the front row stands up first and sits down. Then the second row, as soon as they sit down, you stand up. And it's a race, okay? So I thought we'd have a wave race. Is that okay? <laughs> so why don't you put your stuff down? And we're going to have team A. Your team A. Up in the aisle. Team B, team C. There's a bit of a disadvantage, but we'll see how we go back. Now, I'll just have even more, more fun. Have you seen that movie, Scent of a Woman? Oh, you? Don't like Gavin. He has this catchphrase. Can you remember what his catchphrase is? Ooh ha! So when you stand up, you go, Ooh! And when you sit down, you go, Ha! Okay? Can we just practice the U-A? First of all, count of three. One, two, three. Ooh ha! Ha! And so, to, to back, and then when we get to the back, you need to look round to the front, and whoever's the fastest team is the winner. <laughs> but we'll just have a practice, so team A, are you ready? Down in the front, and I say go, who, ha, and to the back, wave to the back, and then to the front again. So team A, are you ready? Count to three. One, two, three, go! Who, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
is what I might be doing at any one time. What's going on without what's going on? Because if you want to study great presenters, what we tend to get lost in is the content. Yeah? And that's important. But I'd also like you to notice if you knew, and there's some people that have traits that you don't know, bloody hell, right? You know, so for example, one of the key ideas is you've got to get people in the room. And you've already seen two demonstrations of that so far. Mexican quaves are a bit Mexican of I've got Mexican, the waves are a bit extreme version, right? But you don't want jobs to get in the room. Otherwise they're still thinking about that meat in the room. Or have I got any cat food in? Or I've got to make that important call, phone call. So when you're designing any presentations, also when you're designing, but number one thought should be, what can I do to get them focused, to get their attention, to get them in the room? And if you get to do something with their body, even better. Getting people to put their hands up is a really good technique. And as I say, getting to use their whole body, that's even better. <coughs> so, I was, you may be wondering why we're here. I don't mean here. And I don't mean on a profound level. Although you can. <laughs> <laughs> you can that as well. Uh, we, we've just come in, uh, my colleagues here, Curly, you might get a spot later. Curly, yeah. When I say it's Curly, obviously she's a ball, the canton from Texas. But she's not, she's a lady from Leeds. And um, we just done a two day workshop. We, we, we only text up eight people, senior executives for um, edX. Have you heard of them? Exactly. Well, good, then. Thank you very much. That's one person then. <laughs> <laughs> Might need to work on the branding a bit more. Get Paul on board, right? Brilliant company, amazing vision. Want to provide free education around the world. And we have this senior, I think called C Suite or whatever, right? Including the guy who founded it, the CEO. And he's been presenting for 30 years, and his biggest crowd. Been 2,000 people, and even he learned something. So I'm sure you will. Right? So that's why we're here. So we thought we might as well pop along, say, and tell up, Paul, give you some like, a bit of fun on the Friday. Is that right? Have some fun. Yeah. Hey, dude, how are you doing? So, first thing I'd like you to think about is why you'd want to become a brilliant presenter. Because what I know about goal setting or achieving all your life, if you've got the massive why, <laughs> Because especially if you're scared of it, which, by the way, most people are, you need a massive why to overcome that, don't you? <coughs> to reflect on why you might want to improve. Well, I would give you a few reasons, but one would be just around the corner from here, Harvard, Harvard Business School, and they did some research on leadership. And the, the basic re research question was, what gets somebody to the top? In any business, whether it's your business, engineering, it didn't matter. And they identified some key characteristics and ranked them in order of importance. So things like being visionary, tick. Values driven, tick. Being able to look, look at some numbers and make sense of them, tick. But the meta skill, the one that sat at the top, was being able to do what I'm doing right now. Why? Because, first of all, when you increase your confidence, that plays into everything else. Our company that does this is called the Confident Club. When we're at hotels doing it, and it's, you know, the sign outside the room, it says the Confident Club, people think it's like a dating agency. <laughs> it's not. Because we realise although our vehicle is, is presentation skills and beliefs and things, actually the result is more confidence. And, you know, if you think about that CEO of the, of the company we're training this week, he's not exactly lacking in confidence. But we can all do a little bit more. Who's got kids? Blimey, yeah. Who's just got the one? Who's got two? And we give me three. <laughs> what was I doing there, by the way? Getting in the room, right? Um, if you could give your children, any children, a gift, it would be the gift of confidence, wouldn't it? Because if you're confident, it's like the bedrock, right? So, once you get good at this, your confidence stores. Not only that, but more importantly, or just as important, your profile stores within an organisation. Because so few people can do it well. And you'll know that if you've ever been to a wedding. Well, yeah, right? My work is quite interesting, so, um, right, maybe not. Uh, so I travel the world, so I'm not doing training, I'm doing speaking thing, right? And I normally get the slot after lunch. Now, this slot. If you knew what is the slot of this particular session call after lunch, what do people call it? No. Sleep, what was that one? Sleep slot? Graveyard, yeah? Uh, Sven Ripper, who I think has moved on from Mr. Print, uh, German financial guy based in Barcelona, 
when we were doing the workshop, I said, what's that slot at your lunch call? His friend said, the death slot. <laughs> <laughs> However, if you can overcome those things and, and even deal with the death slot, can you imagine it just for your profile? Well, if you're one of those rare people, but I travel the world, and trust me, people are still doing death by PowerPoint. I know because I see it through them all. Can you imagine how many credit test that's after? According to research by Microsoft, who, who invented the thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> how many PowerPoint presentations do you think could be given globally around the world in the next 24 hours? You think it's more than 5 million? <laughs> According to research by Microsoft, in the next 24 hours globally, there will be given 30 million PowerPoint <coughs> presentations. Question, how many of those are going to be stunning and amazing? <laughs> so I don't want, because this, when this is being filmed, I don't want Bill Gates to sue me ass, right? So I'm not saying PowerPoint is a bad thing, but what I would say, <laughs> I appreciate your laughter. Can you try and coordinate it a bit better? <laughs> try and all laugh at the same time, right? But anyway, so I'm not getting too bad building. So I'm not saying PowerPoint's a bad thing, but what I would say is, and you've probably been on the receiving end, and hopefully you haven't delivered many of these, most people don't use PowerPoint. What most people do is abuse it. <laughs> and how they abuse it is to remember as a presenter what they're going to say and do. Would you agree? And in extreme cases, they read the slides to you as well, don't they? <laughs> and you know those people who come out and go, the start by going, because the start of the presentation is critical, right? It's a really important part, which is why we work out of it. But those people come out on the first slide and they go, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a bad slide. You won't be able to read it at the back. <laughs> <laughs> why are you showing it today? Because it's not for you, it's for me. So we need to get to the point where our confidence and our profile allows us, and then we have some other ideas to go with that, which is called you know, um, money in your pocket, really, um, that allows us to go and I can teach the PowerPoint. Because if you do currently use slides, you need to ask this key question, is the slide for the audience? And if it is, great. But if it's for you, not so great. But that takes some confidence, doesn't it, right? Um, but I guarantee, if you get a big reason why, it's going to get you to the top, isn't it? Because how the business feel says it will. You can do this stuff. It's bound to increase your profile, isn't it? Because you're going to become the go-to person. Can you present? Because you don't do the death by PowerPoint thing. I love your presentations. Don't want you presenting. Just, I know you're great. Because you're also boring, right? And not a child. But more importantly, if all that happens, you're going to make more money as well. That's three reasons, right? Confidence, profile. <laughs> That's why. So then, if that's the one, <coughs> what is it we need to get good at then? So just reflect on it. You know, if you think about, you're familiar with TED.com. Mm -hmm. You know what it should be? Great website. Um, free, free videos of like amazing speakers with great content. It's a great study thing. If you think about maybe a typical TED talk or any great presentation you see, just reflect, what are some of the tools or techniques that people use? Shout a few out, what do you reckon? Personal story. Body language, the body language is massive, isn't it? Controlling this thing. All right, call that state, what do you do with your body? 55%. Right, 55% of your own verbal. So we know from research, one of the best TED things I'd recommend, if you haven't seen this, is by a lady called Amy Cuddy, C-U-D-D-Y. She talks about the Wonder Woman pose. Fascinating <laughs> stuff, backed by science. But we know when people are confident, they stand not to say like this, but like this, symmetrical. That says to the audience, this person's really on, in control. And because you stand like that, it's a double way mirror because it's like it says to the audience, this person looks pretty confident, but because this is how we stand when we're confident, you feel confident. So this is really powerful. Now, say you're getting a challenging question, you can back it back with this kind of physiology because you can go, that's just how it is. However, sometimes you want to be a bit, a bit more fluffy, don't you? So you want to deliberately, with intention, be soft to think asymmetrical. So if somebody asks you a question, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all with intention. But when it's not with intention, you get this a lot with ladies when they're presenting. This kind of thing going on. You get this a lot with men. Don't know what's going on there. <laughs> <laughs> you get a lot of this going on. 
So you're right, body language is pretty big. What else? What else is critical in terms of the what's that we need to think about when we're going to do a great presentation with your effort? Pictures. Yes, some people read visuals, so you know pictures. Um, if you use them in the right way. So there's lots of stuff. In fact, you know, if you did that workshop, there's tons of stuff. I could give you at least 21 ways to get people in the room to start to ten. Right? So there's a ton of stuff. But I was thinking, um, I'd share my three favourites with you. Because we've only got a bit of time, haven't we? The three that I think you can take away and think I can use that straight away because I'm from Yorkshire, right? So I want to present practical, right? So if we think about this, if we think about the how. So we know why we want to get better profile. Confidence. <laughs> we need to think about what that's looking at, right? What are some of the things, common factors, whoever people are. Now, the other point I would make about this is, I think people get lost in the content rather than the techniques. Is there some sort of an election going on here at the minute? <laughs> no. Not really. And I think the challenge is, we're not going to talk, we're not going to talk politics, but we are going to talk communication. So if you take one of the candidates and one of the others, when I'm watching these debates, yeah, I'm kind of sort of interested in what they're saying, but I'm just, if not more interested in what they're doing, Penn and Teller style. You know, like if Penn and Teller was to do it, trying to figure it out, how are they doing that? So should you. So for example, you'll notice repetition is big in it on both sides. Why do they constantly repeat the same phrases over and over? Because it works. <laughs> Professional speakers call it a phrase that pays. Who did they get it off? And why do they keep doing it? Well, it goes back beyond with so many people like Winston Churchill, even. We will fight them on the beaches. We will fight them on the landing grounds. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. I can't remember the two slogans from this one. I don't want to go there. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> You know that it's interesting, isn't it? The other thing I think that's important when you think about either candidate is this phrase that pays: "Manner always wins over matter," and that's absolutely true for this campaign, is it not? Manner, so the way in which you're doing something, the way you deliver something, is just as important as the content. Yet we tend to get really focused on the words, but that's where body language and how you say something. Because you know, those people come out and go. It's really important we get excited about it. You think, no, is it? Is it not really? <laughs> right? Or these people come out and go, yes, I'm really confident. And you're going, oh, okay. <laughs> I have no issues with this at all. Right? So the three, the three key, if you like, what's that I think can work better as many, but I think these are core ones. And to help me with this, we're going to go into our teams again, right? Because it's the three S's. The three S's, not the S's. The three S's, right? So, have you ever played charades, Team One? Hello, Team One. Give it away. What am I doing now again? Get me involved. Have you not done it? No. <laughs> so, so uh, when I go like this, you're going to say the word, okay? As a team, and the word is story or stories. But let's say story, okay? So you ready? Count three all together. So, what's our first top way of doing things? Story. Uh, rubbish. We'll try it again. Are you ready? Stories. Stories. Stories are brilliant. So you'll notice that whether it's a politician or a great communicator, a great presenter, they are brilliant storytellers. Have you noticed that? And particularly their own stories. <coughs> particularly of their own stories. Our second key idea is controlling how you feel. Now you might call that state. State. S-T-A-T-E. Or mood you're in. Now I would argue if you can't control how you feel, and to some extent, or to a great extent, how the audience feel, it's game over. So all these tools and techniques we're discussing and exploring now will count for nothing if you are could be met for it. So we'll give you a couple of topics on that. So our second key idea in terms of um, the how, how we should do things. So the first one is Sorry. second one is state. Are you ready? State. Okay. So story state. And then the last one is structure. It's a bit of an hard one to say to you, but it's structure. And structure is a memory aid as much as anything. So this is where you have a template, something you follow, so you don't need notes, for example, because you've got on this bit now. It's a template, it's a structure. And there's many different structures. I'm just going to use one today because it's a really powerful one. 
But if you have a structure, you know where you are, so you don't need this light to tell you where you are. This is how most people do it, right? So it's structure. What is it? traps that people fall into with stories, they'll come out and they'll say, uh, well, first of all, how not to get people in the room. Here's a bad slide. Hello, everybody, now for the boring bit. <laughs> Hello, everybody, just some housekeeping. <laughs> the, the restrooms are there that expect for the fire alarms. You know, that's how not to do it, right? <clears throat> but the start's important. But some people come out and say, I want to tell you this true story. Now, when people tell you that, I immediately go, is it true? <laughs> and it's a bit like when, you know, if you're in the, the bar or the restaurant and somebody says to you, usually a bloke, hey, I've got this really funny joke. <laughs> and you're kind of going, it better be funny now, isn't it? <laughs> Much better just to tell the joke and see if they laugh. So I would like that to say with stories. Another top tip, not part of the three big ones, but another top tip is, if you're ever presenting, get there as early as you can. I mean, why wouldn't you? you want to check out the room, check out if the mics are working, and then that doesn't always work either, but you know, we can do your best. So doing this gig, um, it, was, it was after lunch in the dead spot, and because uh, nobody the brief there is that they're so bored by then, that whatever you do would be better, to be honest, than the dead by proper. And it was in York, which I think you'll probably, most of you would have heard of in the north of England, in a hotel next to the train station. And I got there, I wanted to be there all day, but I couldn't, I got there for the first coffee break in the morning. And it was a, a software company. And it was back in the day, they did software for accountants. And it was for their end users, in other words, their customers. And there was like 500 of them there. So I get there, it's a coffee break, and I'm looking for the client, I'm looking for the CEO, or the MD as it was in the UK. And all the, all the customers are in there having a coffee. And you know these, when you have an event, they have these fantastic themes, don't they? And they have these posters, mass communitization from there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> there's no I team. <laughs> this one was, um, together we all win, or something like that, right? It's posted everywhere. So I'm looking for the client, and he's not with the customers, and he's, I think he's still in the conference room. So I go into a room like this, it's empty, because they're all in coffee. And in the corner, there's like a little huddle of guys, and there's an atmosphere. And the best way I can describe it, it felt like somebody died. <laughs> so I thought, clearly something's going on, so I better just hold back a bit. But like, time's wasting, and the client always wants to know he's been speaking here, you know. So eventually I had to kind of like sign the look and like kind of go like this. And I went, what? This is a private meeting. I mean, yeah, I can see it. It's just a thought I'll let you know because my coffee's nearly over. I just think I don't want to get a speaker. And the MD just went, Bloody hell, I forgot about you. Can you wait outside? And I'm like, okay. So I got to So five minutes later, he comes out and said, There's no other way of putting this, Steve. We've just found out we've gone bust. We're out of business. He said, well, we've got 500 customers out there, and they don't know. <laughs> so to be honest, I don't think we want the funny motivational speaker after lunch. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, okay. Come back, what time do you want? I said, 2 o'clock. He said, come back at 5 to 2, and I'll let you know. I said, great. In the meantime, can I talk to the production people at the back? You know, these big events, like we've got a camera person there, so there's only like a big mixing desk at the back. So I want to do a sound check in that. So I go to the back, and there's a guy sat behind me that sound decks like this. Oh no, oh no, oh no. And I went, excuse me, <laughs> what? I said, um, I'm the guest speaker, could I do a sound check? He said, have you heard what's happened? They've gone bust. I said, no. He said, this is a one-man business. You know, I've hired all these electricians and techie people, and it's cost me 15 grand. I'm packing up and going home. Because I like to motivate people in the Yorkshire, I went, well, I wouldn't do that because, you know, he said he's got to speak to the receiver and there might be that guy in the white charger and he's going to know he did him a favour. Or worst case scenario, they do go bust, but these senior guys are going to go to different companies and they might ask for us. Right at that minute, the hotel manager's walking past, right? And she goes, oh, well, Steve, because I've done a few events there. 
Are you speaking of this event? I went, I am. She said, have you heard what's happened? <laughs> I said, I have. She said, we're not serving them lunch. <laughs> I said, well, you know, a few years ago, I suppose, that's the first chance I had to go call my agent, right? Yeah, I called Brendan back to get Brendan off him. Brendan, bit the first this, what's that stage? Right, you might be on stage soon. Yeah, yeah. It's just I've got here and I've just found out the company's gone bust and I've just heard him drop the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and I now know afterwards because he had to run to a computer in the corner and Chet came by and he said, it's okay, they've paid us. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I like to think that even if they had the papers, I'd still have done it, right? So imagine it's now 5 to 2. And this guy's got my introduction that I've given him. Because it's good to have an introduction, right? Like all the fantastic stuff, all right? So he's got the introduction, so I need him there. So get there. Now, you know, if he says it's going to start, I get mic'd up and I'm waiting for him to come to introduce me. And they all know my now, by the way. Every Saturday, I'm looking a bit miserable. A bit like you, really. And, um, <laughs> And you know when you say we're starting at two, it doesn't. People get kind of a bit restless quite quick, don't they? So it gets to five past, still not there. Ten past, still not there. Twenty past two, he comes literally rushing onto the stage like this. I'm still waiting in the wings for him to introduce me. He goes, I'm sorry, we're there. I know we want to start at two. But all this time we've been on the phone to the receiver. And obviously he's now no, I need him to take that call. By the way, everyone's still staying together, we all win. All <laughs> And they say, I'm afraid the news is much blacker and bleaker than we originally thought. My team at the back, the receiver said, you can't go home in your company cars. You've got to give me your car keys. Then he looks at the guy in the audience and said, John, you were asking me earlier, is the £250,000 that you've invested in the new software saved? I've got to tell you, I don't have a clue. <laughs> anyway, we asked you, do you want to see the speaker? He said, might as well. So here he is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just have a pen and tell a moment about storytelling, right? That's just a demo. So the best story is your own. Why? Because nobody else can tell them. Come on. Uh, great for memory, because you literally just have to play the film back. I mean, I was about there. That did happen, by the way. Um, detail. You might not even know where your kids do matter. Acting it out. It was like professional speakers call it a bit of show and tell. So you, I was coming over one of the in a huddle. Because I want you to be a picture it. So I'm not just stood here like this. And I'll go outside. So those are all techniques. So again, when you see a great storyteller, notice what they're doing in terms of techniques. The stories are one of your best friends. And then they can have a message to them. And the message is, do you know what? Presenting, you're not going to actually die. No one's ever died. No, we didn't look. We did some research on people's biggest fears, ramped in order, and we did this because somebody said it. And in fact, I had the Daily Mail, which is a fantastic newspaper in the UK. And um, <laughs> they were asking me to give top tips on presentations for business people. And I quoted these figures, right? And they said, the statistics. And they said, what's the source for them? And I said, I think it's just something people say, you know, like me. And they went, oh, we can't use them then. Well, it's Daily Mail, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, PR opportunity, we'll do the research. So we interviewed on a, a, a YouGov survey a thousand business people in the UK and asked them about their top ten fears. And coming in at third was um, the fear of dying at 28%. <laughs> coming in at two, I think at, at 30 odd percent, was the fear of heights. But number one, all things being equal, 42% of people, right, were afraid, afraid of speaking in public. Which means most people, including you, would rather die. <laughs> <laughs> than speak in public. And it's our goal at the Confidence Club to make sure you do them both at the same time, right? <laughs> um, so stories are good, right? So what was our second thing? State. So state, right, so let me give you a top tip on state. So state is the mood you're in when you do anything or when you present in particular, right? Or mood or state. Here's my top tip. Most people don't take responsibility for how they feel. Most people say it's not to do with me, how I feel, and I have no control over it. It's to do with the weather. It's raining, I feel crap. 
<laughs> or it's, I'm fine, it's to do with other people. I felt grateful and met you. <laughs> so it starts with taking responsibility for how you feel and say I have a choice. Now, have you heard of something called NLP? Who's heard of NLP? Who's not heard of NLP? Put your hand up if you hate audience participation. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> neural linguistic programming. It comes from California originally. It's like a therapy. If only they hadn't called it that. Neural linguistic programming. You know what program me, pal? That's in the UK, right? If they called it now, let's perform. Maybe better. Anyway, we move from therapy to business. I quite like some of the things around NLP that are practical. And NLP has lots of techniques to massively change how you feel. So what NLP is about, if you ask a thousand master practitioners of NLP, what it is, you get a thousand different answers. But if you just ask me, I'd go, NLP believes that everything is a strategy. So what human beings do is a strategy. So getting to work on time is a strategy. Falling in love is a strategy. Staying in love is a strategy. Being good at spelling is a strategy. Now, if you take that to its nth degree, that must mean charisma is a strategy, doesn't it? So what NLP's done is studied charismatic communicators and speakers. Now, remember, this is content free. In other words, we're not saying we agree with a message, because some of them are quite nasty people. But we do all agree they're incredibly charismatic and could work the room. What can we learn from that? So the model people like Martin Luther King, who, by the way, didn't say, I have a plan. <laughs> John F. Kennedy, Adolf Hitler. Today, it'd probably be Obama, Trump, possibly Clinton. Um, <laughs> and they discovered they did similar, if not identical, things that made them charismatic, right? Um, and we model people. So as a mate of mine, I, I'm a big believer in getting somebody who's better than you. You know, because the people you hang out with are typically at the same level. So people call it mentors, don't they? You know, hanging off the coattail. So a really good friend of mine is a master, master trainer of NLP based in London, a guy called David Shepherd. And I work with him a couple of times a year for free. Because he's a mate. But also because every time we turn up, he's even better. And it's annoying. <laughs> Bloody hell, you were great last year, you're even better. What have you been doing, right? So a few years ago, I said, you know, NLP is based on Wadley. Like, finding somebody who's excellent what they do. I've come up with this new event called A Date with Excellence. And I'm going to get various people, a bit like Ted in a way, that are experts in the field, and I'm going to model them. And will you do one of them? And I said, well, how will that work? He said, well, come and do what you normally do on stage, like I'm doing now, right? And then I'll sit you down and I'll do like a, a chat show interview. And I'll ask you some key questions, and we'll figure out what your strategy is. And, and I'm going, which sounds quite interesting. And he said, and you'll find out things you do that you didn't know you did, because you're doing them on an unconscious level, right? Just going off the side, by the way. Um, I think, people said, how do you know when you're doing a great job? When you're presenting, for example. Well, I don't know if you can explain Einstein's theory of relativity in a minute. I'll give it a go. Here's how you know you're doing a great job. A 45 minute presentation feels like four minutes. And you can't remember a thing you said of it. Which is why I'm Right? Here's how you know when you're not doing a particularly good job. A four minute presentation feels like 45 minutes. And you can remember anything you said in the week. So to be truly great at anything, uh, athletes call it flow, F-L-O-W. -F uh, musicians call it in a groove. But you have to be out of your head. I don't mean on the Budweiser. I mean, you have to, <laughs> you have to be out of your head. So if you're ever inside, if you're ever inside talking to yourself, you can't be doing flow, right? So that's one of the things I discovered about what I was doing. But the other thing I discovered, the key part of any strategy, is the beliefs that you have. So I just want to share with you a couple of empowering beliefs that I'll move on. So we identified these beliefs that I have that enable me to do what I'm doing now. Because beliefs, you see, the thing about beliefs is this. And, you know, I'm loath to call it presentation skills, but that's what people are familiar with. But at the Confidence Club, we don't really do presentation skills training. We do more like presentation beliefs training. Because if you ever wondered why anything, either at Simpress or anywhere else, 
you know, when you're doing a culture change program, you have a wonder why sometimes you don't get the results that you expected. And I think it's often we put the emphasis at the skill level. So say we want to teach people to answer the phone properly. We go, we need to design a how to answer the phone properly workshop. We send a lot of colleagues on it, and we give them some skills training, and then they come back to work, and then they do it for a bit, and then they stop. And we're back to where we were, and they ever wondered why. Because I think beliefs have to come before skills. Trust me, if you work with me, I can give you tons of skills about how to do what I'm doing right now. But if you didn't believe you could do it, you're not going to do it. So I think operating at the level of beliefs is important. That's why I'm going to share some with you now. Right? So beliefs. So the first belief I would encourage you to have is this. From today, next time you give a presentation, here's how to get a new belief. Just start acting like it's true. Just do that. Don't wait for it to be true. Just start acting like it. So imagine, next time you give a presentation, you acted like this belief was true of you. Give yourself permission to not be perfect. That's not belief. Be a person, not a presenter. Because you get people who don't, you know, because people say to me, how do you decide how much to work to, how much work to put into a presentation? I'm trying to really depend on how important it is. A quick tea briefing, maybe not as important as, you know, Robert's going to be here tomorrow, Robert. You know, for him, I'm guessing that's quite a big presentation, Robert Keane. By the way, I'm at Robert Keane's house. Do you know who Robert Keane is? <laughs> In the south of France. <laughs> Remember, I'm the lad from Yorkshire, right? So, in Robert Keane's garden in South France. And I knew at that time, this was a few years ago, I knew he did the calendars and all that. And, 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 and I, wasn't, I didn't really realise he did mugs. So, Robert Keane is literally where that table is in his garden. I'm here with the mug. And I look across it, I see on his mug, and I look at my mug. There's a photograph of Robert Keane and Barack Obama. So, like a numpty, I says to Robert Keane, I didn't realise that Vista Bridge could drop people's faces into a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, no, that's me with Barack Obama. He's like a friend of an old friend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, the thing is, you have to be perfect, right? Just be a person. But the only people that want to be work perfect, where they learn a script, top tip, if you're trying to learn a script, you're an actor. And in the UK, it's called Dragon's Den, where they have some entrepreneurs. What's it called in the US? Shark okay. Tank. No, but none of those titles work for me, but anyway. Charts, Dragon's Den. But if you know that format, it's like six entrepreneurs, and, and they have them, I don't know it's like the States, but in the UK version, they're in like this old warehouse upstairs, and they're like right over there. And they've always been told, straight faces, don't need anything. And then whoever the budding entrepreneur is, they're downstairs, and they have to have this walk up the stairs. I've coached two people that have been on Dragon's Den. Not before they went on it, after they were on it, to be fair, because they wanted to get to speak it. But they were telling me about their experiences. They went in most of it. They deliberately tried to wind you up to make you feel really scared. So they'll, they'll pick you up with a limo at five in the morning, take you to this obscure location where this warehouse is, put you in a room with a chaperone and take the cell phone off you. And then they'll say, you're going to be on at one. We'll come back for you at one. So you can have what that does to most people's state, can't you? Right? And then they come back at one and they go, actually we've had to change it, we'll come back and let you know when you're on. And then they'll let you sweat for a bit more. So they just mess, because it's better telly, isn't it? It's better telly when you're somebody's nervous. Anyway, eventually it's your turn and you have to get, kind of go up those stairs and there's the dragons, all the sharks, and they've been breathing, nothing, nothing. Yeah. And you're putting your thing up, right? And I remember episode one in the UK, a guy get, gets up. And he's gone for writing the script and trying to remember it word for word. And he goes, <coughs> Dragons. <laughs> the reason I'm here today is that I, um, oh, could I just start again? <laughs> Sweat punches now. <laughs> Dragons. <laughs> the reason I'm here today. And it's like having to look through your fingers eventually. So you don't want to be here, right? We're perfect. Equally, by the way, you don't want to be here. You know, those people just turn up and go, I'm at my best when I just wing it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you want to be somewhere between the two. So the best advice I could give you with that in terms of being a person is kind of rehearsable, act spontaneous. Uh, Ken Robinson, who's a personal friend of mine, is the most watched uh, clip on TED. So Ken Robinson, if you haven't seen that brilliant clip, it talks about innovation and creativity, which is your business, right? So it's worth checking out. Uh, brilliant, brilliant speaker. And I said to Ken, you know, you speak all around the world. What's your top tip on giving a presentation? And he used a metaphor, 
which is a really powerful way to communicate, by the way, metaphors. And this guy could give me the great speech, he's like playing jazz. Not playing jazz, not playing. It's like playing jazz, it's like you go out, which I've done today, with a tune in mind. But it's okay to go out and twiddle a bit now and again. So we heard about spontaneous. So give yourself permission to not be perfect. Be a person, not a presenter. What you also need to know is the audience want that too. The audience don't want work perfect. What they want is a person. In fact, the audience quite like it when something goes wrong, when your microphone doesn't work. And all they're interested in is, are you okay about it? Which he was. Right? Are you okay about it? Some of my American speaker friends understand that idea so well that they deliberately make a mistake. They deliberately make a spelling mistake or whatever. So the audience has got, thank goodness she's a person. So that's my top tip, right? Be a person. So beliefs are important. There's many more, but that's my, my favourite one, right? And then there's other ways you can change how you feel. The quickest way to change how you feel is to change your physiology. Now again, as Yanks, as Brits, as whatever, I know you've got 38 different nationalities, so who God knows what we've got in this room, but you know what I mean. As people from around the world, I think we're not giving much thought to the thing our body does. And this ties into the body language thing as well. We tend to go, I need to change my mind, but actually changing your body is the quickest way to change how you feel. Because we've said again, that way, things show. We call it, body language experts call it leaky. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so next time you're going to an important meeting, or you're about to give an important presentation, or whatever, and you can out of sight, just check your visit. You know? Because I don't think we've got any doctors in the room, but we know, don't we, what the physiology of acute depression looks like. That's the idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> Curled up with a ball. So we know, you know, if you want to be look like in control, head up, shoulders back. If you watch sport, you often see sports coaches don't they go, get your head up. You know, when a team's losing, the, the commentators are saying, their heads have gone down, right? So you've got to go in there, think, check the physique. Quickest way to do it, actually, is to put a big stupid smile on your face. Especially when you don't feel like smiling, because it's going to be a challenge in that interview or that presentation. Because your mind and body can't tell the difference. So you put a big stupid smile on your face before you go in, then you, you, your mind and body go, oh, you must be happy, go on then. <laughs> However, don't do it halfway through the meeting, that just looks weird. <laughs> <laughs> Well, obviously, you can change how you feel by what's going on in your head as well. That's just as important uh, in terms of state, state <coughs> management. So that's to do with a couple of brief things. That's to do with how you talk to yourself. You know, that voice in your head. Because you do talk to yourself, don't you? You know, unless you possess <laughs> a spinning head. Moment, that kind of <laughs> you do know it's your voice, don't you? Can you imagine if you talked out loud to your family and your friends and your colleagues and your customers? How you ready to talk to yourself inside your own head? Would you have it? Of those thousands of things you say to yourself every day, and they're ready to talk to yourself every, every ten seconds, so you're doing it now. How many build you up and put you in a brilliant state? How many knock you down? The difference between a great presenter, peak performer, whatever, and somebody's not so good. Poor performer, going into that important interview or meeting or presentation, and pulling poor phys physiology as well. And then the weedy voice in the head, they're going, You never know. They might like me. They might like this presentation. By the way, if you're doing that out loud, you've no chance. <laughs> but because you're talking to yourself like that, it floods out through your body, doesn't it? And the panel or the people in the audience are going, don't know. Whereas confident people, and we're talking about generating confidence, in a powerful tonality, are basically saying things like, your ass is mine. <laughs> you're going to love this, because this is going to be so easy. Even though it might be a challenging situation. Because they're running that in the head, it comes out through the body. Think about it, Usain Bolt. We all know Usain Bolt, he's doing that Olympic um, 100 meter champion. And I love Usain Bolt because back in the day, the 100 meter runners, the Americans, the Brits, whatever, they used to do that tunnel vision bit, didn't they? You know, eliminate everything, tunnel vision, just before the race. Have they seen Usain Bolt before us? It just bubbles about, doesn't it? It's like, <laughs> since it's not what great stuff to do with some eyebrow stuff, right? <laughs> We bring the basket, tracks through, messes about, kisses the woman, all that, right? Do you think you're so bold? That line's going, 
You never know. I might win. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, right? So, there's some house, right? But the key message with the state thing is, take responsibility. Go search out. Well, uh, NLP for Dummies is a great book. Get my book on Amazon, get that, whatever, right? Um, <laughs> And then uh, the final thing was, was structure, wasn't it? Structure. So the structure I've been using today is called the format structure. And it's based on some research, and it's what great teachers use to plan their lessons. And it's what great presenters could use as just one structure. Because it helps them create some really rich content, and it helps them remember where they are. So if you think back to what I've done, pen and tell a moment, I think I know you did that, Steve. Right? What did I do first? Well, I got you in the room. Got to get in the room first. Bex can wait. Then I did a massive reason why, didn't I? Why you want to improve Harvard Business School. Remember that? <laughs> then I did, right, what do you think it is? What's the what? <coughs> well, okay, if it's that, if it's, if it's storytelling and it's there and structure, how do you do it? Give us the top tips. And the final part of format is what if? So the idea is that you've got four types of learners, say, in a classroom, or four types of people in an audience. You've got white people. I mean, they're interested in this, but the more important is what's in it for me, right up front. They want to know that. So you start your presentation with that. Here's a big reason you need to listen. <laughs> but you get some through. So we do our marketing like this, you know, when we're selling the workshop and stuff. We give people a massive reason why they might want to work with us because we know we've got some white people reading it or looking at it or listening to it or whatever. But yes, what people, and these are the people who go, can you give me a shopping list? Can you give me some bullet points of what we're actually going to cover? So we do that in our marketing as well. Right, so we went through some what's, didn't we? But then you've got some how people go, well, that's fine. I get that, I get that. But how are we going to do it? Now think about this if you're working on a project, which I'm assuming most of you are, and you want to sell this project to a colleague or to Robert Keith or whoever, right? Don't mention Barack Obama. Um, <laughs> first thing you could say to them is, this is why it's really important that we do this. What is it that I'm suggesting? How are we going to land it? It's a dead simple format, isn't it, that you can just do before the meeting. And what if people, these are the people who go, yeah, I'm interested in that, I'm interested in that, I'm sort of interested in that. What if I was to do the workshop? Or what if I was to accept your project? And they kind of take themselves into the future, and they go, after we've done it, what will happen? And it's a powerful way of constructing the finish, which is where we're at now. Because that's the structure, right? We're on this bit now. So we want to say now. So what if then you were to get yourself a mentor like I did? What if you would get yourself like a confidence coach? What if you get yourself so you could help you with your presentations? What would that do? What would that do for your profile? What would that do for your profile?